And the more important thing that goes along with this, whenever you're catching fish on a certain spot, note the time. Too many people yeah. pass that up. And the timing is when a lot of this happens. And that in particular spot was two o'clock. I promise you they were not there at one o'clock. And we come back there and look and at two o'clock, all of a sudden there's arches. And I was like, whoa, look at this, unbelievable. Yeah, that, that seems to be, you know, that, that factor plays harder and harder, it seems like in the summertime, the hotter it gets. Yeah. Like the hotter it gets, the more on a schedule they'll start getting where they'll be over here at this time and they'll be over here at this time. And you know, when you're running offshore structure, that can be one of the biggest factors. If your timing's off, yep. you can be having a terrible day but if your time is on, you can kind of catch them everywhere you go sometimes. Well, and I've had some spots before, too, that we had a timing, 3 o'clock, whatever the case. Well, lo and behold, uh, you know, sometimes I'll check these spots if I'm in the area, just randomly graph over them at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. And lo and behold, look, they're there. And then you go back at 3 o'clock, they're not there. I've had a couple of two or three spots like that that they think would fake you out. And they were there, they weren't there at 3 o'clock, but now all of a sudden they're there at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. And we had a spot the other day we started on at 11 o'clock and we caught 22 on it. I've been back that spot three consecutive days in a row at 11 o'clock ain't got a bite. <laughs> you know, and I mean that's how frustrating it is. You know, so the groups move in, they move on. I know they have to be in the area and I've checked the area out, all the contours, the drains, the ditches on these deep spots, and they're just not there. You know, so that's why you keep running, you keep running, you keep running. But keep a mental log on the time and that you're catching these fish and then you, and next year, same thing may happen. And it also relates to water depth, uh, level, water lake level. I pay attention to the lake level there more than anything. And when that lake, if, if it's at pool, a lot of fish will react different in those deep areas when it's at pool versus when it's at one foot low. So certain places really come into vogue when the lake is one foot under pool, two foot under pool. Some of the best patterns that I have during April and May are if the lake is two foot to three foot low. Insane. Like he's talking about in those four to eight foot ranges at that time, how many 10 pounders we catch. Whenever the lake is at that. But if the lake's over to pool, they're not there. So we begged that the lake's down in early May, late, late April, two foot. That's a key number. Yes, sir. When you're talking about timing on these fish, does that correlate to a uh, time that the shad or something is coming by there? You know, uh, that in particular spot that I caught that, I did notice that there were sand bass on that spot those several days that we were there, but I have seen sand bass there, not in as many on days after that that we didn't get bit and there were still some down there but the big bass wasn't there but those in particular days there was bait there and i've had two or three other spots when the sand bass were a little bit thicker there and those big fish will get right in the middle of those sand bass right, right. because they're after those little bitty bar fish that are about that big or the little sandies right so so they are following schools of sand bass uh, they must be fish and stuff like that we had a spot that I check every single day and we haven't done well on it and then one day Lance Vick ended up on the same spot and the sand bass were on that spot that day he both he and I drilled them we killed them that day on that spot and then they haven't been there since why because the sand bass weren't there I was seeing big clouds <clears throat> of of bait like this in a certain couple of areas this was last year two years ago all right and and I was catching big fish in that area, but I thought these were shad, right? And so I thought, man, I'm just, I happened to be in an academy and I walked by and I caught a glance at something and I looked and it's a sabiki rig. Who knows what a sabiki rig is? Sabiki rig they use in salt water to catch pilchers and stuff like that for sailfish. It is a little bitty feathers about this big. There's six of them on a deal. So I thought, hmm. So I grabbed it off the rack, brought it with me, rigged it up, put a one ounce weight on the bottom of it, put it on a seven and a half foot rod, and I just put it in my rod box in case I ever saw that again. All right, sure enough, a couple of days later, I saw it again, and I thought, ah, oh, damn, dug in a rod box, dug that out, and I just let that thing down. It was in 24, 25 foot of water, and I just held it there. Thunk, thunk, you could feel them hitting it like that. I just reeled it up. It was barfish that were this big, clouds of them, and I thought, son of a gun. Who, who would have thought barfish would run together like that? And they were, all of them were that big. And I thought, that's the first time I ever seen that. I could have swore they'd be shad. It looked like shad on the graph, even on chirp. You know, so. Uh, the barfish and the, uh, 
white bass that they're trying to fall with more. They'll, they'll eat those things, and I'll tell you why they eat them, is in the fall when you're fishing certain structures, throwing little spoons, three eighths ounce spoons like this. We've had it before where you throw out there and you're ripping that spoon off the bottom and boom, you have a little bite like that, God, dog it. And you're trying for the bigger ones, you know, yeah. sometimes clients like to catch bigger sand bass. And this is in October, November, and you reel that thing in, all of a sudden the rod just goes like this. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm using 12 pound line and it's just game on, eight pounder. Came up and ate that little bar fish that you had on the spoon. So. 100%, those <clears throat> big bass on this lake love eating bar fish. There's no doubt about it. And <laughs> what's funny is, with what I've talked about tonight, what Dave was talking about is, I've actually, in the dog days of summer, had some shallow water structure like we were talking about earlier, with channel running through it. And seen fish kind of like schooling and popping in there, and it seemed like little ones, so, kind of like what Dave was talking about, to see what it is, I tied on the smallest little crankbait, I actually tied on a baby one minus, <laughs> yeah, baby yeah, one yeah, minus. Yeah, yeah. it's been years ago now. Tied on a baby one minus, ran through there, and one of those things that was schooling, slapped at it, Hit the baby one minus, I reeled it in. It was a bar fish, a little bit smaller than the length of my hand, in the back of a creek in July. So the deal is it's the life source. So, I mean, this this is a lot of the things that have to do with timing on offshore spots have to do with wind. When the wind doesn't blow, your timing will get monkeyed up. But if the wind's blowing about the same three or four days in a row, your timing will be the same every day. Uh, what happens is that wind blows plankton across these spots and you've got 40 foot of water out there in the middle of the lake. As it blows that plankton through that lake, as it goes over this spot that's 20, 15, 25, whatever it is, it takes that plankton that's spread out in this much water and it condenses as it, as it goes over that structure. And so now the plankton's way thicker here in this part than it is over here. Just the natural crane plankton that drifts through the lake. When that plankton gets condensed, those little shad, those little glass minnows and little shad that are out there roaming around those balls, when that plankton gets condensed, that's feeding time for them. So they go up there and start feeding on the plankton. And then the sand bass and yellow bass start feeding on them. And it's just a life source. But really it's about the wind. The reason we always want wind on offshore structure is it, it condenses plankton over the tops of these high spots, which gets the bait fish gathered, which starts everything off. And so that's a lot of your timing deal is a wind deal. Yeah. yeah. If you paid attention to the last week, the wind's only blowing 100 every day. It's been blowing. <laughs> every day. Been and blowing. I'm telling you, we were on the water every day in that. I'm telling you, you might need to take a look at some of that shallow water stuff, I'm just saying. Well, I haven't. I've stayed deep. But here's an interesting deal that nobody would really think about or look at. And we were fishing some of these deep spots out there, literally taking them over the bow and yes. catching them and catching them. But yep. the interesting thing about this was, was that, and I had this happen last year and the year before, on big wind days, common sense tells you the wind's rolling over a point, all right? Big, and it's gonna do what? Move current. It's moving the current as it comes over. How deep will it move that current is the $64 question. I'm assuming it's going deeper than 20 foot, to be honest with you, all right? So when the water's coming over that point, you would think it's gonna eddy up on the back side of the point if it's coming straight across it, okay? Say the point's like this, wind's coming this way, it would eddy up over here. This is where those fish are going to be waiting for bait to come over. Right, right, wrong, wrong. Ended up throwing onto the front side where the lead edge of the point was on the inside into the wind. I dug out a lot of backlashes too, by the way, uh, for clients. And I'll be dipped in it. That's where those fish were. And I've had that happen several times where they move from where I would think they'd be to the other side. And that's how we caught them that day. And so if you do not keep an open mind and can move with, you know, the challenge, move with the challenge. And then they've got to be around there somewhere if you've been catching them in that area. And so that's exactly what we did in those big windy days. Ah, dog it, man, that boat stayed full of water. But we were definitely catching them, you know. So keep, just keep that in mind. All right, is there any questions on anything? Yes, sir. I got a couple questions. One for each of you, David. You were talking a few weeks ago about uh, using that uh, the big worm on dropping shot. Yeah, shot we changed to a three-quarter ounce weight on the drop shot. What are you What are you using for a hook on that? On a, if I use a big worm, I'll actually go up to a bigger hook. I normally use either a one or a two on a drop shot. All right, normally. And but whenever I'm using a bigger bait on the drop shot, like a say a full size brush hog, I'll probably even use a one aught or a two aught on it on the drop shot. 
And that's a good question though, because also in this wind, the way the wind was blowing, I mean, we're throwing three quarter ounce. I had clients one day, this guy just, man, he stuck to it. He wasn't going to change. He's throwing a drop shot and that's the way it was going to be. And he caught 13 that day, uh, you know, but we had to amp up the size of the weight just to compete with the wind. The hardest part about that is, is feeling the bites on a drop shot. You're never going to feel a thump, thump, thump. It's just a load up. Most of the time you lean into it a little bit and I know Billy's gonna love to hear this 10 and 12 pound line and uh, light line and you just lean into it and then you wait to see if that tip moves the beautiful thing about a drop shot is no matter what bait you're using they're gonna hang on to it they just don't dump it and turn loose of it no you know I tuned out as soon as y'all said drop shot <laughs> <laughs> uh, but and the thing is like is that magnum, yeah. like even a magnum and if the if the bottom's clean and some of these areas if I know there's not a lot of roots or whatever the best bait you can throw on that and I'll even use a one a number one one Kamigatsu offset wide gap hook, all right, is a magnum trick worm. A magnum trick worm, hook it wacky style. And man, I'm gonna tell you what, you can catch gi gi giants on that. But the bigger bait, the, they want, and wacky style, bigger bait, and you, people I watched some clients this week, God dog it, man, they want to run this thing 88 miles an hour. No, just take your time with it. Ain't no big race. And I mean, max line we'll use is 12 pound on it. 12 pound and I, what I'll do too on mine on my bait casters I, we like to use bait casters more leverage but using f uh, mono line down to a 35 pound swivel and there's good reason why I have to do that I want more stretch in that because if they hook a 7, 8, 9, 10 pounder on that the rods we're using are 6 to 12 line rated rods so they're going to absorb a lot of that right? And but what that line stretch will help is to keep them on there and then we use a fluorocarbon leader you know that will be the camouflage hopefully and I've even seen that here in the last couple of days some tricks I've pulled in order to get more bites and using leaders like that have helped uh, on those lighter lines so yeah. do you have another question again? I have one for you okay what do you pick between the hollow body and the solid, like let's say we're back at the chow hall area. Right? Yeah, okay. The one you taught me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. And we were fishing the hollow It's a great stuff. name for it, by the way. I don't know why I haven't thought of that. It's awesome. Well, that yeah. Means, I thought that you called it something like that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the, we were throwing hollow bodies. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I don't know if you remember, I saw you out there and you were throwing solid. Yeah. And I was just wondering why the difference. So uh, it's just a difference in action. The hollow body, the entire the entire bait vibrates and it has a very quick, fast kick. So it's a fast, the tail's kicking like this, the body's kicking like this, fast action. Uh, the solid bodies have more of a this. You know, there's a head kick to it, but not near as much and it's a little more of a subtle, slower deal. So basically if I've got less wind, or if the water temps are a little bit cooler than normal, or if they've cooled down some, uh, anytime basically my water temps start taking a downturn, if I'm not getting bit on the hollow body, okay, I'll slow, try to get a little slower action. It's just about trying to mimic the speed of, of the bait fish that are moving throughout the water column in that area. Um, and, and a lot of times wind can be that factor too. If I've got a lot of wind, I hit that hollow body and boom, 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 and it's got more vibration. If there's more wind, the fish can't see as good on the surface when we're fishing shallow water. So when there's more wind, I want something that has more vibration, more uh, drawing factors to it. And if, if, it, if it's less wind, okay, or cooler water, or clearer water sometimes will make this decision as well. Uh, I want a more natural presentation and less drawing factors. So that slower tail kick is what I would consider more of a less drawing power presentation. And that hollow body and the vibration is more of a higher drawing power. So depending on a lot of different factors, again, because it's bass fishing, but basically like this time of year, most days I'm gonna throw the hollow body. Unless it's just flat calm, I'm gonna throw the hollow body because the water temps are really warm right now. And so everything's moving really fast. Cold-blooded creatures, Warmer the water gets, faster they move. So the hollow body's kind of been the deal for me lately up shallow. It's been my best bait. Uh, it was our best bait today. First first bite we had today was an eight pound over, and it was on the hollow body. So um, it's just about speeding up or slowing down a presentation is the only thing I'm thinking about. A lot of factors that go into that, but that's the deal. Hey, before we move on, uh, we've had some new people just roll up just now. Registration is currently open. So if you're wanting to register for the tournament, Come on over to this table. You can get registered as we're as we're doing the seminar. And uh, actually, can you slide over for a minute, David? Justin, uh, Blake. Yeah, come, on. come on over here with me for a second. Hey, David. Hey, hold on. Unclip that.
Come sit down next to me for a second, Mr. Blake. Oh my God. Let's see. Ask you about in the oh, room. sorry. Is this that? Y'all about to learn about the real Marine Corps now. <laughs> I heard that. Okay, Army dog, calm down. So I goodbye to my style, steals my shirt, and then starts talking crap about the Marine Corps. You believe that? Well, if he's got some facial hair like that, I mean, I'd probably look at <laughs> Yeah. Fair he'd point. Look like he's been to Tijuana, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 he does. So, folks that are watching on camera have never seen me wear this ring before. And I don't want to monkey up the, the, the story behind this ring and the meaning of it. Okay. So I want to bring you over here. And by the way, guys, they do have these rings for sale. 22 kilos, these rings for sale right here. So could you please fill us in on this ring right here? Okay, so basically this is... Hi, I'm Blake. What's up? Glad y'all are here. Awesome. Hey, so it's a mighty fine stash he's got. It's pretty 70s, you know what I mean? All right, so yeah. the honor ring is a silent salute for all of those men and women that have sacrificed everything. A ring, there's no beginning, there's no end, right? So we always remember those that have gone before us and have passed on and things like that. It's a, it's a way to start that conversation. It's a way to sit there and remember your buddies, remember your friends, remember those people that have sacrificed everything for you, your community, and your families. So we wear this every day as a constant reminder of that sacrifice. We have that constant reminder in front of us every day while we get to enjoy things like this in this weekend. Um, we're gonna meet a lot of you and I want y'all to ask us questions about kind of what 22 kill means uh, and about some of our experiences. So how many people here have heard of 22 kill before? Anybody, a few? Okay, so back in the day, there was some research that came out in 2012 about suicide for veterans 22 a day taking their life at their own hand the va came out with that research so after that we started a non-traditional well way of providing information about this you know at raising the awareness yeah right? raising awareness right. with the push-up challenge that started to go viral with the rock and all them uh, to really push that awareness to the social media platform to get the word out there so we started the 22 push-ups for the 22 veterans a day that take their life at their own hand. So we started to really think about it. We started raising, you know, that awareness and we started really trying to find out how to impact the community in the right ways instead of just surface level stuff. So we developed into a full-fledged mental health organization where we provide counseling services for veterans, first responders, and their families. Because those family members are usually some of the reasons why we put on the uniform in the first place, right? So we want to make sure that we pay homage to that sacrifice for them as well and get them involved in those stories and support and all those things could help somebody in need. So we started out with Stay the Course, which is our program for mental health. And then we have other programs on the non-traditional side. So Stay the Course provides traditional clinical mental health counseling services, peer support, education, things like that to kind of get that foundation of knowledge that you need to really kind of tackle this epidemic. So with that being said, we have those non-traditional uh, programs as well because not everybody's into the whole asking for help. I know for personal experience that, I mean, it was a cultural thing. Like, if you ask for help, you were seen as weak. Especially in the Marine Corps, they're gonna give you shit for it. So it's something that, um, you know, we kind of developed that, you know, tough mentality. Yeah, I don't need help, I could fix it on my own. And that ultimately is what kind of helped raise the number of suicidal ideations among the you know veterans and first responders. So, uh, with that being said, I'm the Forge Program Director, which is kind of why we link up, I guess, the outdoors and stuff. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. My mom's watching. You did not have to stop. I know it. Oh. Um, so we do hiking, camping, fishing, helicopter hog hunts, aerial gunnery shoots things like that. We also have the wind therapy program, which is the motorcycle side of the house. Anybody ride motorcycles? Not one person, awesome. So I'm moving on, I'm kidding. Oh, awesome, awesome. Um, so we have courses with Harley Davidson all over the country to really get those courses uh, out there. If you wanna ride, they also get you fully licensed and they also help you out with getting your first bike. Um, so that was a really cool kind of program we developed. And then we have Watch and White Star Families and stuff like that to accommodate um, all of those men and women that have sacrificed everything. They have those families that they've left behind, that legacy. 
So it's called We Are the Children of Heroes, which is our watch program, which is really awesome. So a lot of you probably ask why we have so many programs, right? We serve a very diverse population. So we have to have a very diverse activity base, right? So not everybody's into fishing, looking pretty with skeeter boats that are got glitter <laughs> Gl on them. Glitter rockets. Yeah, glitter rockets. Yeah. Uh, some people are into firearms. I'm a firearms instructor as well. We do range days every week. Uh, we do fundamentally uh, type classes to protect people's home and assets and things like that because some of those families don't have a protector. So we really get that education and training out. Uh, but all the non-traditional side, all kidding aside, is designed to get you in the door. To get that right. mental health uh, aspect there, you know, it's okay not to be okay, and also get you the help that you need in the time that you need it. Um, you know, we have a very wide array of people that serve in different ways. We have volunteers, we have people that are clinically trained, we have people that are trained in the outdoors, such as guide stuff. Uh, we have great connections in the community uh, that really help kind of welcome people into the tribe, you know. Uh, it's that one tribe, one fight mentality. You're not in this alone. So by abling or being able to present a platform and foundation for someone to go in a boat and go fishing for the first time and learn about kind of the tranquility in that. I mean, you could get really in depth. I don't know if y'all listened the last hour. I know I blacked out. Uh, but anyway, it's you can get really in depth with it. It's all challenged by choice, you know. So, um, well, the, the biggest deal, if I can throw something in here from my personal perspective and my transition from from being in, in the military and Marine Corps to to being in the civilian world, is we all live that tribal lifestyle in whatever branch we're in, whether it's right. fire department, police, to any military branch you want to talk right. about. You do everything together. In four years, you never eat a meal without somebody from your unit with you. You just don't even eat a single meal, hardly. I mean, unless you're on leave, right? right. Like you don't. Um, and so there's, you always have somebody there. And if there's something wrong with you, like if there's something not ticking up here, even if you won't ask for help, if it's something bad enough wrong, them guys that are with you they're are gonna, gonna kind of, they're gonna come back, hey dog, come here, you know, and they're gonna they're gonna take care of you. Right. And the biggest transition for me coming out of the Marine Corps in the civilian world was it's on me. I moved out here to East Texas. I didn't know a soul. I didn't know anybody. My wife got a job in Tyler. That's how I ended up here. I had no idea or designs on being a fishing guy at Lake Fork. Uh, I can get into that story another time. It's actually kind of ironic and kind of hilarious. The fact that I ended up making my living here. There's Anyway, squirrel. We won't chase it. I will. Not our usual procedure. Usually we chase every squirrel around here. But my biggest challenge transitioning from the Marine Corps to civilian world was feeling like I was on my own. I didn't know anybody up here. None of my family was from here. So I go from having all the support, like support, so much support I didn't even want. Like, y'all leave me alone, you're annoying support. So now it's, I've got to figure out how to make sure that my wife's taken care of. Oh, now we've got a baby on the way. I don't have a college degree. I'm trying to figure out how to pay the bills. There's another one on the way and I don't know how I'm gonna feed him. And I've got, I'm on my own, alone. It's on me. And the best thing, in my opinion, that 22 Kill does is it finds every way possible to make sure that no veteran or first responder ever feels like they're alone. Because in most of these cases, you can't save them all, but in most cases of suicide and suicide attempts amongst these guys, that feeling alone is one of the biggest factors. If they don't feel like they're alone, it doesn't get there a lot of the time. And so the best thing they do is all this different stuff that Blake's sitting here telling you about, all the varieties of reaching out. It's about getting them in the door and that's what you need to do because they have to know that they're not alone. And that's the biggest deal. I've, I've walked that walk myself. Um, again, I'm not, didn't see a lot of the horrible combat stuff that a lot of guys see, but it's still, it's a lifestyle change and a mindset change and it can wear you down. It's a tough deal to, 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 to swallow and to handle. So. Um, go get you one of these rings and then put it on your trigger finger because that's where this kind of ring belongs, right? Absolutely. In my opinion, anyway, I wear it on my well, trigger finger. Well, we wear it on our trigger finger as a constant reminder mm -hmm. of taking your life at your own hands. Yep. There you go, man. What a great organization. Um, can't thank y'all enough for, for working with us on this deal. They have stepped up. We got we got kind of rained out earlier. We had a great display up here before most of y'all got here and then the rain kind of we got worried about so we took everything in. So... 
the money that's going towards 22 kill, be it 100% of the auction items, all that stuff, Blake, can you kind of explain to where this money goes? Yeah, so, y so okay. y'all's money that we're gonna, we're, we're gonna write a big check at the end of this to 22 kill, and we're gonna let you guys know how much we've raised and all that. Uh, and 30% of tournament entries, 100% of auction items tomorrow, including the guide trips uh, for Sunday in the guides tournament, all that's going to 22 kill. What are we gonna use that money for? Basically providing counseling services for veterans and first responders to get mental health treatment. So it goes directly to that. It pays for their sessions. Mental health has statistically proven to save lives, hands down. A lot of us, I know for me, you know, trying to get mental health help was definitely difficult. I had a horrible experience and a lot of times in your profession, <laughs> it could ruin your career by wrong diagnosis. Yeah. By that label, right? I know a lot of pressure has been put on a lot of people in order not to get help. It's easier not to get help. You know, just statistically, everybody that is here right now, without further education, is still using the same coping strategies that they were using in seventh and eighth grade. That gentleman, that gentleman, that gentleman, all of us, unless we get educated. I had a horrible experience. I thought I was Mr. Awesome. I mean, kind of, you know, it's fine, it's whatever. But I found out that I couldn't do it alone. I had a horrible experience. So for me, do you want me to tell that? You okay. want, it's up to you, brother. And it sucks. I cried on that thing. I don't want to do it now. Well, we're going we're gonna to do that tomorrow on the boat. But if you want to do it now, that's fine. You want to do it twice? I'm just here to win. <laughs> kidding. All right, so I was in the Marine Corps. Um, from 03 to 11, I had a really great experience, you know, being a Marine and stuff like that, but lost a lot of guys uh, due to suicide. I lost uh, some guys over there. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I came back, I, I was pushing everybody I ever loved away. I didn't know what to do, how to do it. If I didn't have a strong support system like my family or my friends, I wasn't, I mean, there's no reason I was going to still be here. Um, with that being said, so I got some help. I went to the counseling uh, suite downtown, I guess on base, which is Oceanside, Camp Pendleton area. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, Main side. So went over there, this 23 year old kid, he was just doing his job, just trying to make a difference in the world. He just got out of school, never served a day in his life. He sat there and was, I was telling my story. I was telling him why I came in and tell me about, you know, roles, boundaries, and expectations of counseling because I've never been in it. So he kept saying, oh, I understand after everything I freaking was saying. Now I started, you know, like hearing it like a tick, like when somebody's doing a speech or like you when you talk, it's like, um, um, cause you can't think of something fast. It's fine, we're working on it. So. <laughs> I'm not most, great at work, by the way, for the record. I'm not real good at that work thing. <laughs> right? Um, so I got really ticked off. And I was like, what do you freaking understand? I stood up in the counseling suite. He's 23. Of course, I'm a Marine thinking I'm full of piss and vinegar. Think I'm somebody, right? I had a chip on my shoulder. And I just flat out was just done. So I stood up. I said, what boots do you put your freaking dog tags in? He couldn't tell me. It's your left boot. I was like, exactly. So what the F do you freaking understand? And I got up and I walked out. I didn't go back to counseling for eight years. That was a dark freaking eight years, good to go? That sucked. I pushed everybody I ever loved away. I couldn't keep a job. I was hustling. I always had like four or five jobs. Uh, I just tried to stay busy. That was my coping strategy. Tried to hustle, went to the oil field. That was awesome. <laughs> Bullshit. Anyway, so uh, when I got back, I, I tried to get an education. And those eight years, I really developed into the man I needed to be. I learned those hard lessons, you know, of not pushing people away, being able to have the courage to ask for help when I needed it. It wasn't anything but a miracle that I'm still here, just even serving. Getting hit with IEDs or something like that, I mean, it'll change your behaviors. It was hard for me to even go to work. For a little bit of a reference, not that you need to be validated anyway, but just for a little bit of a reference, how many times you been hit by ID? A few times. I don't want to talk about okay. that. Okay, okay. A lot. So, yeah. I'm very lucky to be here. One could say that I don't have any eyeballs because obviously I hit every one of them over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I need to work on my prescription. Um, but anyway, so 
I really had a hard time and I had to learn those hard lessons. So I started going to the oil field, making money, chasing that materialistic shit because I thought that's what men did. Provide, be awesome, have skeeter boats with glitter on it. I wanted it. You know? <laughs> I'm getting sponsored by it right now. Yeah, we're working Go. on it. We're working on it. We're going right. to send an email tomorrow. Cool. <laughs> so I've sent a lot of emails. And it, good luck. <laughs> it, it was... Uh, <laughs> It was, a, it was a bad experience. So I got fed up with being in the oil field. It was just a transitional cycle because I wasn't getting the help that I needed in the time that I needed because I didn't have the balls to ask for that help. And I, I could say that now. Then I was, no, I was a fat, nasty turd. I was going to every gas station to go to, you know, on site. I hated my life. I didn't have time to spend any money. I couldn't spend time on a relationship, much less building one. You know, so anyway, I decided to make a change. I went to Texas Tech for a football game. I had a Navy corpsman over there that said that there's some pretty cool stuff going on on the weekend. So I decided to take a trip. Within 40, it's a God thing, straight up. I don't care what you're believing in. If you're getting shot at, you're believing in something. So for me, I felt like this was a God thing, straight up. So I've always been in this position in a headspace to really serve those in need, regardless if. I was an adult, a child, uh, whatever. I felt like that was my purpose in life and I really started to understand that. So I went there, within 45 minutes of me stepping foot on campus, I had applied, been accepted and registered for my first semester of clinical mental health counseling in my master's program at Texas Tech. I hit the ground running. I needed that help, that education. I was so jacked up. And I had conditioned myself and cal well, got calluses on my character because I was so hard headed. I was pushing away resources left and white until they got so tired of me saying no that they gave up. In the Marine Corps and boot camp, they always say never quit, never give up. And that's a constant reminder that's on my arm because obviously I need help breeding. So. With that being said, I really found my passion and my purpose in life. And it was by giving people the opportunity to save their own and to give them that encouragement and a platform to understand that you have everything in your possession internally to be successful. It's if you use it or not. So with that being said, I went right into the doctorate program. I'm almost finished with that. And it has been the biggest blessing of my life one to survive that have such a great support system and then when i was in my master's program i found 22 kill jake uh jacob schick he uh hit me up with a mutual friend went to his house he welcomed me into his home and he was like you got a resume and a dd214 i'm like yes i do emailed it to him you gotta have that on tap you understand be ready so I went ahead and uh, I started my counseling thing, got my license, and you know, every step of the way has taught me just such a valuable lesson. There's been so many people that I've been in contact with that will be in my life forever. And a lot of people, if you think about it, it's the caliber of people you have in your circle, right? That was the biggest lesson that I had to learn. There's a lot of people that come and go in your life, but you need to select the right ones to be a part of your life like this group here y'all are here for the right reasons having some fun learning some stuff making some memories not babies <laughs> I, had to, I had to throw that in there mom <laughs> that was for mama yeah that's, that's for mama, for mama. All, right. all right so it was just something that um really spoke to me and i i hope that that story can really resonate with yeah. you if you don't have a purpose i really want you to redefine how you look in the mirror if you want caliber, be caliber. Nobody's stopping you from being you other than you. If you want to do something, go do it. Don't be scared to look like a jackass. Those failures is exactly what makes you learn and grow, period. So a lot of people that struggle with the past, it's okay, it's already happened, you survived it, you learned from it, right? So at least if you're gonna fall, fall forward. Keep chasing those things that you really enjoy and want to do, regardless of what anybody else thinks. A lot of parents, including mine, was flat out telling me I should do this or that. 
that's that's not how I roll. I'm just saying, I'm not gonna sit here and look back when I'm 70 and I'll live their life. If you wanna try something, try it. So for Caliber, for me, this tribe has been just such a blessing. And I think of my friends and my circle and my tribe just like this. All you shooters out there, y'all will get the reference, but you have a lot of 22 long rifle rounds going down range, making a lot of noise, right? But if you have five 12 gauge shotguns going off at the same time, you're making a lot, lot bigger impact. So make sure you take that lesson with you. I learned that the hard way. And I never, speaking of my past and I learning from that, was I'm never gonna do that in a counseling session because I never know what's gonna come in there and I have never walked in their shoes and I vowed that day to never do that again. To never let anybody on my watch experience that. I want to be welcoming. I want to be understanding and open-minded that they don't come exactly from my way of life, my culture, my understanding. So I'm there to help assist with that. And I mean, I just challenge each and every one of you, if you know anybody that is struggling or having a hard time or you're having the hard time, reach out to those you know people. Reach out to that support system. Reach out to that. You know, you only have one life. Make it count. You only have two dates on your tombstone. Mm -hmm. The day that you take your last breath and the day you took your first one. Those really don't matter. It's that dash in between them. That's sure. your legacy that you leave behind. So how do you want to be remembered? So for me, helping as many people in need that has sacrificed everything for me, my family, my country, I'm gonna be serving them until the day I die. The Marine Corps gave me some of the best years of my life and I'm going to spend the rest of my life paying her back. That's right. Man, that's so. great stuff, dude. That is, uh, obviously, you can tell these are the top people that are involved in this organization, and it's why I wanted to work with them. It's why I reached out, and I, I was so happy and so proud that they agreed to come on board with us and do this. Um, and I tell you what, all you guys, because we got a pretty big crowd in here right now, and all you guys that are showing up for this deal, y'all are making me even proud. We've had a lot of guys come sign up and make their way out of here. We've been going a long time tonight. I know it's been a little weird with the weather. We've gone way over schedule, but uh, registration is open. We'll be here all night until every one of y'all is gone. We'll be here till at least 9 o'clock. Uh, so if you know anybody that's wanting to know what time, we'll be here for a while. Uh, so get registered, get signed up. And come over here and show 22 kill some support. Get you a ring. We'll have some more merch available tomorrow at weigh in. Uh, is everybody that's in attendance pretty much fishing the tournament tomorrow? Yes. Yes. We got shirts. We got stuff. Outstanding. We'll have some merchandise available for you guys tomorrow. We've got some awesome auction items. Uh, we'll look at the radar. If it's going to be clear, we may bring some of those out to kind of show you guys some of what you can see tomorrow. Hey. We can't do any of this without all of you guys out here. Y'all are what makes this thing tick. Like we're up here and, and you know, we want to thank 22 Kill and all that, but uh, myself and we 22 Kill, we want to thank all of y'all because we can't do what we do without each one of you. Uh, but do me one favor right now. Let's give 22 Kill a big round of applause. And, yeah, thank y'all. Thank y'all, man. Yeah. All right. Man. Hey, let's get the music going and have a good time, yeah. man. Thank y'all.